Well, precious ones, welcome to Midway Baptist Church. Amen? I look forward all week to bringing the Word of God, to be able to come and worship while we sit under the Word. If you would, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 5, Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 5. The message we're speaking and preaching on is off the theme, God is speaking, or we listening. To listen is to obey, not to ignore. The Bible says in the book of James, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Amen? We put the word of God in action, there's power. It becomes salt and light in a troubled troubled world. This morning we're going to look at the scriptures on God is speaking on how to live a holy sex life in an X-rated society. How do we remain holy in a country and in a world where it is sex o'clock all the time? No matter where you go, what you do, it's going to come. You know, years ago, I preached this message. I talked about us being in a moral fogginess in the 90s. There's no fogginess anymore. It is out in the open, the promotion of a perversion, perversion that is condemned by the Word of God is overwhelmingly embraced in the day in which your children are growing up. It is not my day anymore. And so what are we supposed to do? I'm going to tell you, without stammer or stutter, and with this message, there's no way I preach it that I'm not going to get people on the left or on the right upset. Do you understand? So I'm telling you, here's the disclaimer. You ready? I didn't write the book, but I'm called to have boldness to proclaim it. Amen? Amen. So if you disagree with the message today, read your Bible and then tell God he's wrong. All right? That's where we go with that. Because we understand the power of social media to attempt to crush people. That is the devil's work, and you can't back away from it or hide. Amen? I don't want it, but we're not afraid of it. Why? Because here's my role. We're going to be dealing with this in the weeks to come, but as we keep your fingers in Proverbs 5, I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the final epistle that the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Paul write. Here's what the Bible says. You ready? Concerning Timothy, the preacher. Paul says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here's what he told them to do. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. You know what that means? Don't test the poles. Don't test the temperature. Preach the word. Amen? Preach the word. It's easy to get intimidated and back off. Self-preservation is an issue with all mankind. But the minister is called to minister to you, no matter what. And so you pray for me that I will be that man. Amen? So he says, here's what I want you to do, Dennis Brunet. Here's what I want you to do. Preach the word, be ready. In season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth 
and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Amen? I need your prayers to be that man. That man. See, why would God say that? Because simply, here's the way. Here's the reality. The power of God is the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is the truth of the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't care what the issues of life are. The cure is to lift up the person of truth, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of truth, which is the power of God, from the Word of truth, which is the Word of God, which is settled forever in the kingdom of heaven. It may not be settled in politics, it may not be settled with the Supreme Court, but it is settled with God. Amen? And so we come. And so what are we going to do in the day where we are right now? What are we going to do? Well, first of all, we need to understand the times where we are. And I'm going to read this for you. You could turn there if you can get there quick. In, in Luke chapter 7, 17, starting in verse 28. He talks about the days of Lot. Jesus is talking about the condition of the world. What it's going to be like when he returns. And he can return any moment. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus says, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. See, God believed that there really was truth in the book of Genesis. That there was a man named Lot, there was a man named Abraham, and there was a Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are not make-believes. Jesus says, as it was in those days, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man appears. God comes and he says, in the last days, people are going to be busy about life. One thing they're not is thinking about the Lord. Everything I listed here, going to church is not one of them. Worshiping is not one of them. Lot, Lot, though a believer, I, I would not have believed that Lot could be born again with the way he lived his life at the end. But the Bible says he was, and he vexed his soul by living in Sodom. But what about that? How does that, how does Lot deal with us today? You ready? It's to understand this. Our decisions determine our destiny. Write it down and write it big. Our decisions determine our destiny. Guys, we got an election coming up. If you don't vote, I don't understand why. I don't understand why. Not to vote is to make a choice. It's to make a choice. And so I encourage you. We have the blessing of voting. Go do it. Amen? Get it done. You see, life is made with choosing. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 13, I want to set this up, and then I'm going to show you how it all applies to Proverbs chapter 5. You ready? This is not a sermonette. The seed's got to fall on a good heart, ready to receive it. Amen? Here's what we've got. In Genesis chapter 13, Lot was the nephew of Abraham. Abraham was his uncle. When God called Abraham, he took Lot with him. And they went into Egypt, which was a fool's errand. They should have gone to Canaan regardless of the famine. They should have trusted in God. But everybody grows in their learning of that. And so did Abraham. He comes back with Lot. And buddy, let me tell you, they had money. 
They had money. See, when you, when you get out of God's will, don't think you're going to get bankrupt all the time. You're going to be morally bankrupt, but your bank account may be full. But you're going to find what money can't buy is what you need. And so they come, and now I'm not against money. It's like oxygen. You need some. Amen? So here they come. And Lot's got lots of flocks, and so does Abraham. Everything Lot has in life is by the good graces of his uncle. So how does he repay his uncle? By letting his flocks and herdsmen abuse Abraham's. And so Abraham finally looks at him and he says, listen, this is not good. You pick where you want to go, I'll go the other way. You tell me where you want to go, and here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 13, verse 11. It says, Then Lot chose for himself all the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. He didn't have to. He was drawn to it. Okay? But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Here's how he does. You read the whole chapter. He looked and he said, oh, Uncle Abe, you know, everything I have is really from you. From you. The land looks much prettier over here. You take that. No, no. The Bible says he looked and he said, man, this looks like the Garden of Eden over here. That's where I'm going. He stuck it to his uncle. There was something wrong with his heart. Amen? So he goes, and then he goes to Sodom. You know the rest of the story. If not, you can read it. By the time God brought judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah for their immorality, their horrible perverseness, God judged it. In 2 Peter, it repeats and explains it. It says, don't ever forget how God dealt with that. The angels pulled Lot out. But he lost his wife. He lost his children. Some in the end of destruction. Others by the life they chose. All beloved. Let me tell you, there's a high price to pay for perversion. There's a high price. And there's some things we need to learn because with Title IX and all the other things going on in our government, the embracing of all things perverse, not all the politicians do that. And praise God for those who pay the price and stand up. But make no doubt, make no doubt, for me, this coming election is not about left or right. It's about right and wrong. I'm watching the whole world that I, I grew up in dissolve in front of my eyes. It just is. And so what do we do? Where can we get our bearings? It's always the same place it's always been, in the Word of God. So choices make destiny, determines destiny. God says, as it was in the days of Lot, so is it going to be. Then at the end, he says, remember Lot's wife. You got to be careful. So what do we do as I'm looking? What can I tell you from the word of God, empowered by the spirit of God in the next 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, that will deeply affect you, your children, and all of your tomorrows? Go to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. Solomon is writing this, led by the Spirit of God. Solomon, who failed horribly in life, is writing, and he's writing to his son. And so he writes, and he says, My son, verse 1, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding. 
that you may preserve discretion, that your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and the mouth is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood. Sharp as a two-edged sword, her feet go down to death, and her steps lay hold of hell. And the Lord give us wisdom. The Word of God is not a club to beat up anybody, but it is a beautiful sword by the Spirit of God to cut the bonds and set us free. Amen? And there's some things I want you to see. Number one, number one, that there's a discretion we need to learn. We need to learn it all over again in the church of the living God. All right? He comes and he says in verse 1, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion. Discretion. Wisdom. Now, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, man, it's going to be a sermon about, about immorality. I know all about that. Don't blow it off. Don't blow it off. You know why? The divorce rate in churches are as high as those who don't claim Christ. The sin permeates all through our country and has touched every area. See, where else, he says, I want to teach you discretion. Where else are you going to learn these truths? The truths of how to be holy, how to stay holy, the purpose of marriage, why perversion is so destructive. Where are you going to learn it? You're going to learn it from the movies? Movies glorify adultery and fornication and perversion. They glorify it. It is a hard task to find a clean movie. What about, are you going to learn it from Planned Parenthood? Which, which aborts babies, hacks them to pieces and sell their parts? It's amazing how that story got buried as it was proven. Are you, are you going to learn it there? Are you going to learn it from the Olympics? Are you going to learn it from the Olympics, who showcased every perversion in a mockery of the Lord's Supper? Why did they do it? First of all, because they're perverted. Number two, because Christians don't have convictions. If they would have been afraid that Christians were going to say, I'm not watching the Olympics because of this, they never would have done it because the advertisers wouldn't have allowed it. Amen. Now here's a big question. You ready? You watch the Olympics? Say, Brother Dennis, you're judging me. No, I'm just, I'm just shining some light. Let me tell you. Beck and I saw it. You don't got to be like me. I'm just telling you. I said, there, I don't care, the pole vaulters, the basketball players, the gymnasts, the near-naked runners, I don't care. I'm done. I'm done. There is nothing there. So much was my heart hurt by watching the boldness and the disregard of Christianity that I wouldn't even watch the highlights well, I'm not going to watch it, but I'm going to check all the highlights. I could care less. Say, Brother Dennis, you, you're talking too much about you. I'm a believer just like you. And if a pastor's going to preach on the word, you, got, you should know where he stands. And because we stand nowhere, we are discarded as just, oh, give them a day and they'll forget all about it. That's, so where, where are your children going to learn? Where are we going to learn? There's only one book that gives us the wisdom, the discretion, the understanding, and that's the Word of God. That's the Word of God. This is an industrial-sized sin that touches everyone. Oh, beloved, 
Can I just speak to you? Do your children have smartphones? Do you really think you've protected them from pornography? If they can get on the internet, it'll find them. That's the world in which we live. You see, there's two things right here, and I need to hustle, don't I? Because I can just camp out, and I don't want to. See, when there's discretion, there's two little things. I'm just going to touch two. First of all, there's a direction that God gives. A direction. To have a direction is a decision. Okay? And that is simply this. Proverbs 6, 32 says, Whosoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. Adultery may not be a crime anymore, but it's still a sin. It has always been a sin. It will stay a sin. It always destroys somebody's life. The consequence is unbelievable to the lust that comes. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. God says, the Word of God says, that the body He gave us is not for fornication. Fornication is sex before marriage. It's sex before mar marriage in all different forms. God says, all other sins are out of the body. The sin of fornication is against you. It changes you fundamentally. You go from innocent to different. It happens. Nobody's exempt. There's a discretion. Amen? Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that the Word of God is not here to destroy us? It's here to save us? Amen. Remember, remember, God's not against sex. God created it in its right place, where it belongs. It's incredibly beautiful. Amen? We used, to, we used to plant a garden. I was never good at it. But man, I'd work at it. And I was so proud of turning that sand into some kind of soil. And it looked so good. Took a handful of it. Walked in the kitchen. I said, Beck, look at that. She said, don't you let that fall on this floor. <laughs> Anything wrong with the dirt? No, it just didn't belong in the house. Amen? The body created by God. Not only that, not only does He give us a direction that we choose, but in that discretion, He gives us a design that we should follow. A design. Look what He says with Jesus when He was posed a question about the total mess man had made about divorce. And they gave Him this convoluted scrambled egg and said, now what... How are you going to solve that? Here's how Jesus did it. In Matthew 19, verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read? I love that. Don't you have a Bible? That is a great question to talk to church people. Amen? I mean, he looked right at them. This was, this, these guys were the, were the cream of the crop that had curdled in church. And he said, Have you not haven't, haven't you read that he who made them, that's God, at the beginning made them male and female? Amen. Jesus took them. You go to, he went all the way back to Genesis 1, verse 27. And in the beginning, God created them male and female. Male and female created he them. I'm just going to tell you this. There's two genders. There's only two. There's always been only two. There's male that's masculine. There's female that's feminine. And God settles that. And you need to, too. That there is the placing together. And in marriage, God created marriage. Between Adam and Eve. He officiated the first wedding. He created Eve and brought her to Adam. He didn't bring a guy, he brought a woman. 
that mattered. And they came together and said, be fruitful and multiply. Amen? Listen, this issue of homosexuality, of transgender, of that touches everywhere, I would be willing to say there is scarcely a family in this room that has not been affected by that. Such as this permeated our nation and the pain that comes with it. Well, how do you deal with it? You just got to get right with God. And it starts, first of all, with the discretion we must learn. Number two, there's a deception we need to avoid. A deception we need to avoid. If you're not going to listen to the word, you're not going to listen to what, I've, what the word's got to say here. Because there is a deception that we need to avoid. Look at verse 3. He says, you better listen, son, for the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. And her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood. See, the first, the first place that you need to understand about deception is distance. Distance. Just because you're a Christian, sexual allurement is not a sin that we can stand, fight, and win. Do you hear me? You can't. You can't. Many a couple, over four decades of pastoring, have come and have fallen because they had a private Bible study time together. You got to have a distance. You have to understand the allurement and the attraction that can come. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 22 says, "Flee youthful lust." You can't spend all the time. We have destroyed our kids. You're 14 years old. Oh, you're going steady. That don't mean going to a date. That means you're acting like you're engaged, planning to get married. And you spin. You start distancing other people. And, and, oh man, you know what? She's just for me. You can't talk to other boys. You can't talk to other girls. You think that's good? I can tell you with the passage of time, the destruction that's come with that. Why? Because they are not prepared to deal with the challenges of being that alone, that together. They count. For the few that survive, they're as scarce as hen's teeth. Oh, listen to me. This world, the Bible says, flee youthful lust. There's, there's a distance you should keep. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee fornication. There is a proper distance that needs to be. But I'm not just talking about teenagers. It's adults that are a mess. It's adults that are a mess. The number one group in America that live together, out of marriage, are senior adults. And I'm not talking about living separately in a house because of finances, because our government has poisoned them that if they get married, they're going to lose benefits. What a godless government. Marriage brings stability. Amen? Amen. But I have never been scolded by a young person who came to my face and told me preaching on this was wrong but I have with senior adults. Yes, I have. And the argument was, well, you know what? God just did that for childbearing years. Once you can't have children anymore, it's free range. I said, how many, how many are there like you? And to my regret, I've learned many. 
many. You see, God warns us. You know, Satan's plan is always allurement. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a deception. Here's how it works. Satan has a plan. It's called allurement, entrapment, and then enslavement. Here's how it works. It begins with frivolity. I'm talking to the men right now. Listen. Wife, if your husband's not listening, gig him. Okay? I want you to hear me. It begins with frivolity. What did it say? It said, the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. Let's call her honey lips. Oh, she's just wonderful. She just has so much good to say. You start flirting. You start flirting. You want to flirt with somebody? Flirt with your wife. Amen? Man, I expect the ladies to clap once in a while. Really? Flirt with your wife. Why? Because there's going to be somebody else who's going to flirt with him. And he's going to be the aggressor. It starts, it starts with frivolity. It leads to flattery. It says this, her mouth is smoother than oil. Oh, you start talking, you start looking forward to talking with her, talking with him at work. Oh, y'all just so easy to talk to. And then in your head, you start thinking, oh man, I wish my husband would talk to me like that. I wish, I wish, I wish he was so attentive to me. And then he's thinking, man, I wish my wife looked forward to talking to me. You understand? Flattery, flattery is a horrible thing. And it concludes in fatality. Always. Look what he says in verse 4. But in the end, she is bitter as worm's wood, as sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold to hell. It's written to the woman this way because he's talking to his son. But there's just as many men that are horrible like this. We got a name for them on the bayou. You ready? We call them a kanakro. All right. Well, what does that mean in English? No, nah, it's more a picture. It's more a picture. It's this despicable guy who wears his shirt unbuttoned to about here with six yellowish gray hairs on his chest. And he's just on the roam. Let me tell you, America is in a bad spot. So, Brother Dennis, that's not me. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. Can we put it to a test? Can we just see something? To be able to, to understand a little bit. See, if we want this discretion, and there's so much more I can say, but I'm going to move on. But if you're going to put it into practice, I want every man listening to me right here. Don't go to lunch with a woman who's not your wife. Not alone. Not alone. And even in groups, don't do it often. Don't do it often. Say, Brother Dennis, Brother Dennis that, that's impossible. Don't tell me that. I've had secretaries for over 30 years here. You know how many lunches I've gone with them? That Beck wasn't there? Even on secretary day, Rebecca takes them. Or I send the secretaries off by themselves, which they like really good. <laughs> you know? I mean, who wants to? Don't do it. Don't counsel women alone. Don't counsel women alone. The Bible says, let the older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands and love their children. I'm, I'm not qualified on those issues. My wife is. Ladies, I just don't understand why you're not hooping and hollering. Don't let someone of the opposite sex 
pour out their heart about their sexual woes. Don't do it. Don't do it. And here's the big one. You ready? No secret social media. Rebecca has access to my phone anytime she wants it. I have access to hers, but the problem is her code is about that long. I... No secrets. Oh, my. I tell you, Facebook, adultery has skyrocketed. You know, man, I got this boyfriend, I got this girlfriend, I haven't seen them, and so I wonder how they do it. Mistake! You want to find out how they're doing? Have your spouse call them. <laughs> You're laughing. I deal with the tears. There's a discretion. You say, Brother Dennis, you're stupid, said the deceived person. Don't get into it. Don't get into it. Where am I? I need to hustle. There's so much on this. Say, Brother Dennis, you sound like you're angry. I'm not angry. I'm broken hearted. I'm broken hearted. Because I see the destruction that comes and the pain and the lies. How do you live holy? How do my children pass living holy, understanding where how things are to be in an X-rated world? It matters who their leaders are in school. It matters who their the leaders are in our government. It matters. If the church that you attend stands solid on the Word of God. Amen? But not only that, not only that, where am I? How about this one? I'm going to have to go fast. If you disregard that, let me show you the damage you'll suffer. You ready? It's all right here. Okay? Look with me. Let's start on verse 9. He says, don't go near a door. How do you avoid this? Two good legs and a hard run. Saturate the place with your absence. All right? So, but if you don't, what's the damage you will suffer? Will suffer. First of all, number one, there's going to be dissipation. He says, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one. Sin cost. It's going to cost you your marriage. It's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost you your wife, your husband. It's going to cost your children. They're going to call somebody else dad or mom. It's going to cost. Sin never pays. It only takes. He says, please, son, you're going to give your years to the cruel. Look at this one. The next one is disease. He says, let's aliens be filled with your wealth. Verse 11, and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. Disease. I used to have a television show. You know that? When we came to Midway, it was a one-hour show. We'd come on Saturday evenings and live call in, and we would take it, the topic of the week, whatever was going on, and it was, it was rock and roll time. We did. And a guy came on and we were dealing about the sanctity of, of, of sex and life. And, and he said, made the argument, it don't make any difference. I said, well, let me tell you what. Isn't it an amazing thing? God created a man and a wife that they can have relationships hundreds, thousands of times if they're married long enough. And rarely... Is there ever any disease mixed with it? But you start running the streets, my friend. And God doesn't send it on you. He just doesn't protect it from you. The last stat I saw was in 2019. And maybe, maybe somebody else can bring me up to speed. 
but the federal government put out about STDs, about sexually transmitted diseases, and back then there were a hundred over a hundred million cases in one year. That's one in every three people. They bury that story, don't they? With the problems and the sterility and the pain. Oh, God, God warns. He says, listen. He says, there's dissipation, there's disease. How about the next one? There's disappointment. Verse 12. He says, and say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised correction? I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear. There comes a time in your life when you just say, when you're caught, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I listen? They lied to me. They said I could, I could have any type of sex I want with no guilt, no problems. I don't even have to put up with children. I can just take a pill. We can kill them. We can throw them away. And none of that's going to bother me. Why didn't I listen? You ever wondered why antidepressants are so prevalent in America? I don't know. I could be wrong. But I think it has a lot to do with the heartache that's come from our choices. Our choices. Not only that, there's going to eventually come disgrace. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the damage you'll suffer. He said, I was on the verge of total ruin in the, in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. You know what he's saying? What Jesus said in Luke 12, 2, there is nothing covered that won't be revealed. One day, everybody will know. What a horror. What a horror. And then we come to the last two. There's dominion in verse 22. His own iniquities entrapped the wicked man and he's caught in the cords of his own sin. Now, y'all with me? You know, it's hard sometimes to listen to a sermon like this. You know why? Because one way or the other, we're all guilty some kind of way. Ain't that the truth? See, there's no way you could preach this sermon if there wasn't grace for a sinner to start again, to find a new life in Christ. There's just not. There's just not. And he comes, and I want to just tell you right here the concept of dominion. He says he's going to be held fast in the cords of his sin. People will tell you, you can never get free of the perversion. You can never get free of the sin. You can never get free from the challenges. And that's a lie. Satan can hold you. You know why? Because your actions create your own chain. When Jesus changes me, he breaks the chains. And I can walk in a new life. Ah, oh, beloved, as we come, and there was one more, verse 23 is just flat death. He will die of lack of from, for lack of instruction and the greatness of his folly. It's a horrible thing to see your marriage put to death, your happiness put to death, your health put to death, and then to go to a Christless grave and spend eternity without Christ when it all could have been different. So what's, so what's the alternative? Are you all with me? Come on. Now we go to shouting ground. Look what he says. Not only that, but there's a design we're command to follow. A biblical design we are commanded to follow. Let's go back to verse 18. Look what he says. He says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, I could not read this in public, but God put it in the book. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. 
and always being raptured, intoxicated with her love. Amen? God says, listen, I'm telling you before marriage, hands off. I'm telling you after you're married, make up for lost time. That's what God said. He said, I didn't keep it from you. I kept it for you. He says, there's nothing better than a loving mate. Amen? Be intoxicated. Be, have your heart pour out to her. It is gorgeous. He says, rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lasting marriage. Only in the things of God can intimacy improve with age. The longer you're married, the truer you find where love is. And he says, I want you to love her, to love her. Let her satisfy you and be enraptured. Isn't that a great word? When's the last time, come on, when, looking at husband, when's the last time you looked at your wife and went, Rawr. <laughs> Wife, when's the last time you dressed up for your husband coming home rather than dressing up to go to Walmart? Go to Walmart with curlers in your hair and armpits stinking. Maybe you don't have to go that far, but you know what I mean. There's something beautiful. Amen? God teaches it all. And God teaches it all. I remember Rebecca years ago at a ladies' conference here. They were teaching on, it was a wonderful conference. It was on wives making yourself available to your husband. Everybody's waiting for the shoe to drop. <laughs> she just went through the scriptures. And she said, let me tell you, it's a job to do that. We never had so many babies the next year <laughs> in the nursery. It was a marvelous thing to see. Guys, there's no shame in what God designed. God's way for God's glory. Amen? So what do we do? I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. And then we need to decide what what we're going to do here. Because there's no one so perfect that doesn't have some, thing, some area to get right. There's no home that doesn't have a hurt in the extended family. I love what the Bible says. Now we come back to the Word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? There's a lot of denominations that need to reread that. He says, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, now I'm talking to Baptists now, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, that's lesbians, nor sodomites, that's men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. That is plain talk. Amen. But, here's the rest. And such were some of you. Can you imagine? The Apostle Paul sends this letter. He knows, he knows the Corinthian church. And he says, and listen, I know I'm talking to you. And such were some of you. The great part is were. I can leave things behind. 
And such were some of you, but you are washed. I praise God that when I come to Jesus Christ as my Savior, He washes away my sins. Amen? Oh, He washes them away. And not only that, He says, but you are sanctified. You are set apart. Not only does my sins forgiven, He makes me a new creature. My nature changes. I don't care how pervert my words and my life were when I became a Christian. I became a new person. Old things have passed away. But not only that, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He forgives my sins, He changes my nature, and He gives me the power to live a Christ-like life. Amen? Brother Dennis, does that mean I'm never going to be tempted? No, that's for heaven, brother. But it does mean I can find victory over every temptation. So I want to ask you a question as, as my sweet wife comes that I embarrassed about four times tonight, today. What's God calling you to do? God's speaking. He's always spoken clearly. Are we listening now? We've gone a long ways in this country not listening. And we're in a mess. But there's no mess that God can't change. Amen? And I'm not so worried about what's out there, but my heart is coming out to who's in here. Because nobody in this room knew what I was going to preach, not even Rebecca. But God put it on my heart. So what's God calling you to do? What's God calling you to do today? There's some. Say, Brother Dennis, if I come forward, everybody's going to think I'm, I'm caught in some perverted sin. Well, I can't tell you, nobody's going to think that. <laughs> but this invitation's a lot bigger than that. Brother, do you need to reset your heart on fire for your wife? then give it to God and say, Lord, I want to be intoxicated with the love of my wife. Oh, there was a man. He was a pill. That means he was, he was just not nice. He gave his wife a hard time. He came under the conviction of God in a sermon about loving and cherishing his wife. He came home from work on Monday. He walked in the house, he had candy, his hair was combed, and he had flowers. His wife burst into tears. I mean, just sobbing. He looked and he said, what's wrong? He said, she said, what's wrong? The dog got sick all over the floor. The washing machine overflowed and you come home drunk. Ha! You get your heart right with God, prepare her. Amen? Ladies, you willing to give your husband another chance? That's a big part. What challenges are going on in your life? Do you have some family members that just need the grace of Jesus Christ and to set them free? Then you come, turn this altar into a place of prayer. Is there a family here and you're looking for a church? Not a perfect church, but a church that strives to love the Lord, love the Word of God and hear the truth. You're looking for a place to raise your family, to settle and to be a part in this crazy day. I think Midway is worthy of just saying, Lord, do you want me here? And if God does and you've settled that, then I want you to come up and let us receive you today.